Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm watching numbers move up. Um, and uh, so we'll just wait uh, until we get to what we think are, uh, the number of attendees. Um, and just to welcome you all, I hope it's all a lovely day wherever you are. Um, and to say hello to our two um, fantastic um, guests, uh, Dr. Roch Cantwell and Louisa Zisman. Um, hello. So, <laughs> hi. We'll just give it a few more minutes. Thank you. Perfect. So we're already um, uh, nearly 100. So I think I'm going to start um, and then we won't run out of time. So uh, just a welcome um, and a thank you everybody for joining um, our maternal mental health webinar. Uh, we've been doing a series of these virtual events since lockdown um, and I'm absolutely thrilled and delighted to welcome our guest speakers today. Dr. Rosh Cantwell and uh, Louisa Zisman. Um, I am going to read from my notes um, uh, just to give a, a proper introduction to, to both. Um, Rosh um, is a consultant perinatal psychiatrist based in Glasgow and leads a specialist uh, mother and baby inpatient and community mental health care for women in pregnancy and the year after childbirth. Um, he's also the lead clinician for Scotland's uh, clinical network for perinatal mental health and leads the reviews of um, very sadly maternal deaths due to mental health causes across the whole of the UK and Ireland. He's also a past chair of the Royal College of Psychiatrists perinatal faculty and the founder member of the Maternal Mental Health Scotland, which is a charity which brings together women with lived experience um, and mental health professionals. And the aim is to promote the development of perinatal mental health services across Scotland. Welcome, uh, Roch. Um, Louisa Zisman is um, one of our most uh, supportive uh, and brilliant um, friends of the charity. Uh, many of you will know her from um, the BBC uh, Apprentice series, where she was a runner-up. Um, she was then asked to appear in Celebrity Big Brother. Um, Louisa is uh, a journalist um, and uh, has um, some very authentic and upfront opinions and writes regularly for magazines and newspapers. She's hosted many events, including the British Young Business Awards, and appeared on panel shows um, for both BBC and ITV. She is a very keen um, horsewoman and uh, recently decided to race train and competed in um, the Magnolia Cup at Glorious Goodwood last year, um, where she raised nearly 25,000 pounds for well-being of women, um, which has gone into uh, women's health research. Louisa has three daughters and is herself no stranger to postnatal depression. So welcome to both of you. Um, you. Before um, I hand over to you, I just wanted to say a few words about well-being of women. Um, we are the uh, UK's women, only women's health research charity and we fund uh, research across three key areas. So fertility, pregnancy and birth. Um, gynecological cancers and well-being issues. Every day our pioneering, pioneering research is helping women, people like all of you, uh, like me, like our daughters, sisters, mothers, grandmothers. It gives hope to those with cancer and, uh, and hope to those who've ha maybe had a miscarriage or have had um, mental health issues, uh, for those who've had a premature baby. 
And it also helps millions of women and girls every day who have health issues like endometriosis, heavy bleeding, and the menopause. Today's research um, is in action in hospitals and surgeries up and down the country. It's saving and changing lives. So our research um, has uh, uh, led to things like folic acid supplements, to HPV uh, vaccine, uh, to protect um, children against uh, cervical cancer. But still more needs to be done. Uh, we've got 33 ongoing research projects at the moment at top academic uh, uh, centres and hospitals, six of which um, have a maternal mental health aspect. Uh, and in the future, we'll help and support women like um, or all of us here um, watching um, at our what is um, really a very vulnerable time. Um, details of these will be up on our website. Um, and I would just like to say, if you haven't already donated, um, please do, because you will be investing in your future health. Um, we get no government funding. Um, coronavirus has had a, a really significant, um, terrible effect, actually, on our um, ability to raise money. So please support us and become a regular donor and help safeguard the future of babies, girls and women, um, because it really, um, the future of women's health is very much in your hands. Now, before I hand over again, I would just like to say that we've had a lot of questions um, in advance and uh, we're going to answer those as we go along. Uh, but if you do have any questions um, that you'd like to ask, please do so. There is a Q&A section um, on these Zoom webinars and we will try to get to as many as possible in the hour that we have. So um, without um, further ado, I am going to hand over to our guest speakers. Um, thank you very much and welcome. Thank you, Janet, very much. Um, I think please, as Janet said, send in your Q and A's. It's an amazing opportunity to ask um, Dr. Rock all of your questions that I will not be able to answer, um, but he is so qualified in his field. So please, please send them in. Um, I think we'll start, I'll, I'll do the relaxed intro um, before Dr. Rock goes into a little bit more detail um, and, and gives a presentation, but thank you for joining. Um, Wellbeing of Women is an amazing charity. Um, it was an honor to raise money for them last year and actually quite eye-opening to see the things that they do do from, for instance, the HPV vaccine, which started with Wellbeing of Women, which now saves so many lives. So it's really, it is a really, really important charity. Um, as Janet said, I've got three three children, three little girls. One's not so little. She's 10 on Monday. Um, and then a two-year-old and a three-year-old. Um, and after each of my children, I've had very different experiences, which always amazes me because I'm the same person. And my experiences have always been so different after after each birth. Um, my first, I'll, I'll talk about, she's 10 on Monday I was just 23 when I had her and um, I really didn't have a great time I had the most amazing birth and I think when I was pregnant I was so focused on giving birth um, and I was very pro hypnobirthing and um, the fact people laughed in my face and said I couldn't have a, a pain-free drug-free birth I was really determined so seriously focused on my birth which was which was lovely and amazing um and then the baby was there and I hadn't really thought however stupid as this sounds about practically having a baby obviously I'd got the pram and I'd got the cot and I've got all my lovely pink frilly clothes um and I don't really know what I thought was going to happen after I had a baby but it hit me like an absolute ton of bricks um and I really really hated it I didn't feel an initial rush of love I didn't feel um that bond that everybody talks about you know as soon as you hold your baby you just get this overwhelming feeling of love and get this protective you know mother's instinct and none of that came to me and um, actually with any of my three children I never had that and I always say that I think it's more common than not to not have that instinctive 
overwhelming rush of love and if you don't feel that I think you're completely normal um I tell myself that anyway because that's how I felt um and afterwards looking after a baby with quite a relatively unsupportive first husband um that's why he's now a first husband not not a current husband um was really really hard the complete exhaustion of sleepless nights not having my mum around my parents were living abroad at the time um and just feeling every day wake, waking up thinking I just I just don't want to do this like this is not what I signed up for I didn't know that life was going to be like this and is this the way that my life is now going to be forever just hating it really and just the constant feeling of just a dark dark cloud over me and a really kind of heavy just heavy heavy feeling it's the only way that I can describe it um and I remember just sitting in her bedroom at nights doing night feeds um crying doing night feeds and I'd go online I mean the Instagram wasn't around then but just um going on birth like threads of forums talking to, to other women kind of got me through a bit um and then one day I just was driving with her in the car and she was screaming and I just thought I just I just don't want to do this and I lived in in the country and I pulled into a lay-by and I literally got out the car and I left her in the car this screaming baby and I just went for a walk in these woods and thank god when I got back to the car which was probably a good 40 minutes later she was still in the car I mean that and now I just look back and think that was the most awful irresponsible horrific thing to do as a mother but in that moment I just needed to get get away from that situation I just was really really not having a great time and my health visitors at the time were, were a bit sketchy I sort of there were two on the go I don't really remember a great deal of of the first kind of nine to twelve months of my first one being born because I just really didn't enjoy it and I think when I have something what I've classed as traumatic happened to me I always shut it out and I kind of had these two health visitors and one of them gave me a quiz well, not a quiz, but a questionnaire to do, um, which I think is, I mean, Dr. Rock, you'll be able to, you'll know, you'll know more, kind of postnatal depression type questionnaire. Um, and she said, oh, you've got quite severe postnatal depression. Um, you know, what, what, what do you want to do about it? And I was like, I don't know what, to, you know, I'd never suffered from, from depression um, in, in my life before. And I'm, I'm very British in the sense of, you know, come on, pull your socks up, sort yourself out, carry on, you'll be fine. Um, and I said, I don't know what I want to do, but I don't want to take medication. I was quite anti um, any kind of medication. Um, and she went, oh, okay. And that was kind of it. And I sort of fell, fell through the net a bit. And um, I had a business at the time, so I never really stopped working. And I used to be working and I'd have my laptop on my dining room table and the baby next to me on a just you know laying on a, laying on a changing mat um and it was just really hard but I think when she was um she was really young maybe eight weeks old I couldn't afford a nanny but I could afford nursery and I found a nursery that took them from I think it was six weeks they took them from really young and I remember walking into this nursery and the lady that owned it was really lovely it was in a house there was really a small amount of children there and I just cried to this woman I was like I just can't I can't work and I can't have her and um so she started nursery when she was two weeks old at uh, two weeks two months old and to be honest having her away from me um, and out the house so I could focus on work and then only only having her for less amount of hours in a day really helped me and it, it just helped me find me again um, I was able to work, go for a walk, have some headspace. Um, and I didn't get any help with regards to medication or any kind of therapy, but I threw myself into working. And I found for me, when I started to regain a little bit of, of my life back and my identity, I'm, I think I'm quite a selfish person, to be honest with you all. Um, I like my life. I like doing things my way. I like That's why I like routine for my children. I could never be... Um, a kind of attachment baby led parent because for me that just that out of control feeling wouldn't wouldn't help me um, and when I started to regain a bit of control and a bit of routine she was a really good baby actually as well um, I 
that that really helped me and so I kind of got through it I'd say I probably had postnatal depression for a good 18 months till I remember one day she came in from nursery and was and ran through the door and was like mommy and I was talking to her and it was only then at 18 months 18 months old I thought oh my god I now understand what people say when they say this overwhelming feeling of love for your child and for me with my first that that did take a good a good year and a half till I thought oh god what would I do without you you're just so lovely and cute and and brilliant and I love you so much um but it took a long time for me my second was my best experience I didn't suffer with anything at all to be completely honest I had her I didn't feel straight away that overwhelming feeling of love as soon as I'd given birth she was born in 45 minutes and it was all a bit a bit of a shock I was like oh my god I just walked in here and now I've got a baby um and she actually got taken to intensive care after she was born um and the second day she was in intensive care and I was still at the hospital I remember going up to the um little baby intensive care unit she was the only baby in there um and I just walked in at three in the morning and just burst into tears. And that was my kind of feeling of love for her. But um, then she came home and we were fine and I was really, really good with her. But I, you know, I had help because I had such an awful experience the first time. And then my third one, I thought, no, I'm super mum. I can do this. And um, I um, wasn't great after her either. Not as bad as the first, but I definitely... Um, felt quite low and she had really bad reflux. I used to call her the exorcist because she would just vomit like projectile after every feed. Um, and I was really scared. I was really anxious to drive with her on my own. So for the first kind of three months of her life, I wouldn't drive on my own in a car with her, which is just now I think of it absolutely ridiculous, but I was so scared she was gonna die. Um, because of the projectile vomiting so when she was asleep I'd go and check on her all the time or if I if I wasn't I did have a night nanny which was amazing but I wouldn't you know I'd make someone always be with her like 24 hours a day um, so I think I had more anxiety after her I guess than depression but again I'm not very good at asking for help um, and I do always seem to kind of muddle through and then come out the other end and think oh god actually I feel okay now and one day I just felt lighter um, I'm probably not the best example of, of someone seeking help because I'm never very good at, at asking asking for help. And perhaps you, you'd you say, doctor, if I had taken medication, it wouldn't have been 18 months with my first one and I would have felt a lot better, a lot, a lot quicker. But I guess I'm, I think I'm like many women that I've spoken to that I'm, I just don't, I always think, oh God, what am I, what if I feel no emotion when I take something? And you can, I'm sure, clear that up in a minute. But um now look i've got three three lovely children and i hope to to some of you watching if you are at your kind of lowest ebb and if you are feeling you can't see the wood for the trees or just every morning you wake up with that feeling of dread or not wanting to not wanting to wake up that um you know it does give you some hope that you can have these lovely children and you can enjoy them um because they are they are brilliant when you're feeling back to yourself and it really is an amazing thing being a mum um, I moan about it a lot but it is it is great but everyone needs their space um, and I guess my way of coping with it was just having some space and having some alone time and reaching out which obviously is extremely hard at the minute during this pandemic um, I've been talking for too long I'm going to hand over to um, Dr Rock but I hope that sharing my experience um, has given some of you some reassurance that you're completely normal and that you don't always like them and that's absolutely fine. And um, please keep your questions coming in as well. Um, and Dr. Rock, I will hand over to you. Thanks, Louisa. And thanks for an incredibly powerful and honest um, description. And I think uh, there are loads of messages to take from it. But for me, one of the big things is how everybody's experience is different and also how actually between babies and your experience with your, with your children is quite different as well. So for even for one person, things vary from pregnancy to pregnancy. Um, and that there isn't the, the problem, and I'll come on to this in, in a moment, but you know, society tells us what motherhood should be about. And actually mm. 
hugely different for everybody, isn't it? And it's about yeah. that bond that you have with your child, that relationship you have is absolutely new, unique. There's no book out there or magazine that can tell you what that's going to be like. Um, yeah. Everybody's is finding your own way in a sense. Um, but thanks again and, and thank you to, to Janet and, and, and um, Lena in the background for all the work you've done in preparation for today as well. It's a real honor to talk here. So I'm just gonna put up some slides and talk to you for about 15 minutes and then hopefully we can come back and tackle some of the questions as well. And um, so let me just get this up first of all. Um, and there we go, does that look okay? Right, so... Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, adjusting to pregnancy, but also about mental ill health and, and the ways of getting help for that too. But I'm going to start off just to say that some of you today will, will have come here, no doubt, um, because you're curious and interested in mental health difficulties and in women's health in general. Some of you will be struggling with problems probably today um, and have been for a while. And for some of you, those problems might be a real struggle and really difficult. Um, and I'm now just trying to, there we go. Um, so it's really important to keep in mind that if you are struggling, there is always help out there. If it's an emergency, you can get in touch. Always, you can get in touch with the GP. 111 is the number you can get hold of across the UK. Um, but if you really don't feel safe in the moment, you can always pick up the phone and even dial 999. And I've put up a few other resources for people who are really struggling at the moment, the Samaritans and domestic abuse helplines as well. And for people in, in Scotland, the Breathing Space Scotland website and in Wales, the call helpline, all give really good instant support and instant help for people who are really struggling. So just keep those things in mind as we go through this. Um, but I guess some of the points in this slide are a little bit um, uh, like Louisa has said already, and we've just begun to talk about what we get from society is how perfect and wonderful motherhood is and how wonderful an experience is going to be and how you must be happy. Um, and of course, real life isn't at all like that both in terms of physical health sometimes and also in terms of mental health. Real life experience is very different from that idealized view that people describe in the magazines that you pick up and sometimes the social media sites that you look at as well. So um, our expectations sometimes, women's expectations and, and new dad's expectations too, sometimes going into a pregnancy and having a baby are very different from what the reality is going to be like. And, and uh, people who've been through it know that very well, as Louise has described. Um, but for people particularly going into it for the first time, that can be a real shock uh, to the system. Um, and again, I'm not going to dwell on this too much because uh, Louise has described what the changes are really, really well. But keep in mind, is that adjustment, it's probably no other thing that's going to happen in, a, in a, a new parent's life that is bigger in terms of the adjustment they need to make than having a baby. Um, so it's a huge adjustment, it's a huge change uh, from what the, your life has been like to what your new life's going to be like with physical and mental changes that go along with that. And then with a new relationship to develop with that, with that infant who's just arrived that you've not known before um, and who is a person in his or her, her own right too. And then of course, constant changes as that child grows up um, and develops and that relationship develops and that in turn leading back to huge adjustments again. So there's, th this, is, this is the story for every parent um, and every parent and every child handles it in their own way. Um, but for some people, uh, sorry, I was going to say, and of course, it's much worse, as, as people have already mentioned, too. It's, it's, there's an extra layer of complexity and challenge for new parents at the moment with COVID-19, with the isolation that that's brought, with the expectation of the normal support that's around not necessarily being there. And I know one or two of our questionnaires um, who've already sent in questions have commented on this, and that that makes life particularly tough just at the moment. So with all of that, for all new parents um, at the moment, uh, it's also worthwhile keeping in mind that for some people, those difficulties are even more uh, challenging because they may be struggling at the same time with their mental health. Um, and I wanted to start off just to talk about a few of the myths around mental health um, so that we can maybe scotch some of those to start off with. So the first is again back to that notion of things being idealized, that pregnancy is a wonderful time. Who would be pregnant? Who would get depressed in pregnancy? It's everything um, I've ever wanted. And we know that 
Many women may suffer from depression, from anxiety in, in, in pregnancy, but the problem is all of us are really good at putting on a front, aren't we? So in public, we're all great at putting on a smiley face. So if somebody's struggling, they go out, they go for a walk with their baby, they go to a mother and baby class, and they see women who look like they're just doing fine. And the reality is inside their heads, they may not be doing well. But for a woman who's already feeling depressed, already feeling anxious, already beginning to compare herself to other people, it can feel for her like she's the only one in the world who's actually going through this difficulty at the moment. Sometimes people will downplay what you're going through. They may say to you, ah, it's just the baby blues, you'll get over it, don't worry about it. And of course it might be the baby blues. And what do we mean by that? Well, we mean some uh, uh, people going through a greater time of feeling more emotional, more tearful, struggling a little to cope. Um, and that usually comes on in the first few days after giving birth. And the important thing about it being the baby blues is that with support from friends, from family, it usually goes away within seven or 10 days. So if something's still going on three weeks later, if you're still feeling depressed most of the time, if you're still feeling consciously anxious, that's not the baby blues, that's something else. And that's something that you might need to get some help with. And a typical thing, if, if I had to um, say what's maybe the commonest thing that people will say to me when they come to see me is, if I tell people I'm struggling, they'll think I'm a bad mother. And they'll think I'm no good at looking after my baby, that somehow I can't cope. And for a small number of women, that's even more severe for them. They think not only I'm a bad mother, but if people think I'm a bad mother, maybe they'll come and take my baby away from me. And that's something I've heard repeatedly from women who really worry about being open, about talking about what they're going through. Um, and of course, the problem is, first of all, that there's still a stigma associated with mental ill health. Um, and most of us, if we have mental health problems, we, we self-censor uh, uh, um, uh, what we say um, because we don't want people to find out about it. It makes us feel like somehow we're being weak in some way. But also, depression and anxiety, one of the core symptoms of them is that they twist a little bit how you think. So they tend to make you feel more negative about yourself, more negative about things around you. And so if you feel pretty badly about yourself, then you probably think other people are going to feel badly about you too. And it's so important to keep in mind that that pattern of negative thinking is part of the illness itself. It's part of feeling depressed. And that with the right help, with talking about the problems, that's a way of managing that pattern of thinking as well. And that will begin to change. The other thing, and I know some of our questions are about this too, is that people will think, well, what's the point of looking for help? Because I can't get treatment anyway, because the doctor isn't going to give me tablets or give me other treatment if I'm pregnant or if I'm breastfeeding. And the reality is that there are treatments that are available during pregnancy and during breastfeeding. And they, they include medicines. They also include psychological treatments or talking treatments. So there are lo there's lots of help that is available out there and that you can have even if you're pregnant, even if you're breastfeeding. And then for a small number of women, that pattern of negative thinking gets so bad that they feel I'll never get better. And a very small number of women may feel so bad about that, that they may feel like they can't carry on with their lives. And that's why I've put those help numbers down on the bottom of the screen again on this slide, because it's really important to keep in mind that, that those thoughts are driven by not being well. And that as people begin to pick up, those negative thoughts tend to go away again. But we know this is a really serious problem and we know that at a time when giving birth and having a baby is a safer thing in this country than it is at, at, it ever has been in history and it, it is in, compared to many other countries in the world, we still know that women dying by suicide is the commonest cause of women dying, um, even though it's very rare in this country in the year after giving birth. So it's really, even though that's a rare, con a rare thing to happen and very unusual, the thoughts themselves aren't that uncommon. And they're all signs that people need to look for extra help and, and, and support if they're feeling like that. So let me move on and talk about how common it really is. So depression or anxiety or difficulties in adjusting to having a baby happen to about one in five women in the UK at the moment. Um, so that's pretty common, pretty frequent, and it means that 
the people who are looking after women um, and their babies at this time are very aware that these problems might arise. And so it's not going to come as a surprise to them if you bring up um, issues around your mental health. Louise has already pointed out that sometimes people don't always get the response that maybe they should get. But I'm hopeful that that's changing throughout the UK and we'll come on and talk a bit about that as well. And of course, it's not just about depression or anxiety. This is a slide that just shows a little bit about how common some of these difficulties can be. I and mean, you can see here that uh, we can go from people adjusting to, to, to the challenges of having a new baby or to being pregnant and being really common up to um, 30 and 100 women through to women suffering from mild to moderate depression happening in around about 10 to 15 percent of women through to women having maybe a traumatic stress disorder based around their previous pregnancy or birth experiences or about other things that have happened to them in their lives. And that happens in around about three in, in 100 women. And similarly, as for women with more severe depressive illness, around about three in 100 women will, will have those difficulties as well. And then right at the tip of that sort of the, the narrow little bit of, of the pyramid of conditions are very uncommon disorders, yet important ones Women with severe chronic mental illness who may become pregnant, who need special extra help in pregnancy, and those women who may suffer a severe mental illness in the time immediately after giving birth called postpartum psychosis. Um, again, it's very rare, but it's a really important condition to pay attention to. And the reason it's important is because we can do a lot to prevent it as well. So it's not just sometimes about treating these conditions, but also about preventing them, which is one of the exciting things for me as a doctor working in this area, that I can, I can stop illnesses happening, not just treat them once they have happened sometimes. So the women who might be a bit more risk of developing mental health problems are those who are currently unwell, let's say in a pregnancy, that might put them a little more at risk of having those problems after their baby is born. And women who've had a mental illness before may need a bit of extra help and support during pregnancy to lower their risk of having that illness coming back in the time after they gave birth. And then women, that, that, that narrow bit of the, of the um, uh, pyramid that I was describing earlier, women with certain types of mental illness like bipolar illness, sometimes called bipolar affective disorder, or in the past it used to become called manic depression. And people who've had a postpartum psychosis before are at a particularly increased risk. And I'm not going to dwell on this because they're, they're pretty unusual conditions, but where this illness does arise, it, it only happens to around about two and a thousand women. But if women have those risk factors, if they've, if they've had a bipolar illness or they've had the illness before, their risk in another pregnancy or after, immediately after they give birth, generally, may be as high as one in two. And it's really important to know that so that we can do things to prevent those illnesses coming, coming on. And so one of the questions that midwives routinely ask um, at booking clinics is whether women have had a history of mental health problems and what those illnesses were like, because that helps us identify the women who might be most at risk of going on to have a problem in another postnatal period, and then for us to get that chance to do something to change the outcome for them. So let me just say if, a little bit about services. So I've got a map up here, which is thankfully already out of date. This map is from 2014 and looked at the availability of specialist perinatal mental health services, those mental health services that deal exclusively with women who have difficulties in pregnancy or postnatally, and looks at those services in the community across the four nations of the UK. And you can see still quite high rates of places that don't have services or have fewer services. Even since 2014, even in the last six years, that's gone down enormously. And one of the things that's been really exciting over the course of the last while is the investment in perinatal mental health services. So most areas of England now have community perinatal mental health services. Increasingly in Scotland and in Wales, um, services are being developed. And really excitingly, just in the last couple of weeks, and there was, an, there was an announcement in Northern Ireland about the development of services there. So these services are spreading out across the UK, mostly in the community, but also specialist mother and baby units that can admit women at the, with the most severe illnesses and keep women together with their babies while they're getting the treatment they need for their mental health problem. Um, and they're uh, present around the UK as well. So in the last bit, let me talk about what you can do to protect your mental health before, during and after a pregnancy. 
And I've got four main things, although the first one is five different bits, I'm afraid. So the first most important thing is looking after your mental health. You get bombarded with information about looking after your physical health in preparation for pregnancy or getting pregnant, thinking about smoking, thinking about drinking, thinking about um, your weight, all those sort of things that will help you uh, have a healthy pregnancy. Um, but it's just as important to think about your mental health at the same time. Um, here are five tips. The first is about keeping connected. And that's so important, particularly now in a time of the COVID pandemic, that we're staying in touch with people. It might not be face-to-face -face as much, although hopefully things are changing, but you can certainly use social media, you can use Zoom, you can use other ways of staying in touch with family and friends. Keeping that, um, keeping those contacts is really important to keeping your mental health good. Keeping active, get a routine in your day, um, whether that's even just a short walk out with your baby um, or on your own uh, as a means of, of keeping your physical health good. And if you're looking after your physical health, it's also pretty good to keep your brain active too. So thinking about things, learning a new skill, uh, taking up a new hobby, doing things um, that give you a sense of enjoyment and that keep your brain active as well. We know that uh, when we help other people, it makes us feel better. So giving back, thinking about things you can do to support your family, to support your neighbors and getting that uh, love back from them too is a really good way of looking after your mental health. And lastly, it's become a really trendy thing to talk about mindfulness these days. And you'll see a lot written about it, but it's actually got a really good kernel of truth about it. Taking care of your of your mind, finding a small space each day. And I recognize this is a tough thing sometimes for uh, for a woman who's looking after a small baby as well at home. But sometimes you don't need much more than five, six, seven minutes out of your day. And there's great apps online um, that help you to do this, where you take a bit of space out, you find a quiet time, uh, a bit of your house, you close your eyes, you get yourself comfortable, and you become aware of what's going on in terms of your breathing, in terms of relaxing your muscles, uh, and giving yourself a little bit of space just to stop that round of worries in your mind. Um, and that can set you up for the day. So there are just a few tips for getting your health, your mental health looked after and keeping healthy. And then the next tip, which is probably, if it came to it, my number one tip of all is talk to somebody. Get in touch. If you're worried about how you're feeling, your GP, your midwife, your health visitor should know about these conditions, should be able to help you themselves or direct you to where you can get more help. Use your family and friends if, they're, if, they, if you feel you can confide and talk in them. And keep in mind that there are good things online. We're always warning people about, about online resources, but actually there are good online resources in terms of self-help. Um, there are also really good local resources in terms of peer support, women to women, and supports that are available in many areas of the country, and charitable organizations, third sectors that third sector organizations that offer really good support um, and are directed at women with mental health difficulties in pregnancy and postnatally. And of course, if you're already engaged with a mental health team, get in touch with them and let them know if you're struggling. And the third thing then is to uh, for those women who do already have any mental health difficulty, start before the pregnancy. Again, your GP or your psychiatrist, if you're seeing one, should be talking to you about this before a pregnancy. But if they don't, you talk to them um, and don't wait for them to come to you. Tell them you're thinking about getting pregnant. Tell them you want to have a chat about the medicines if you're on medication, about your plan for a pregnancy, about any risks to your mental health during pregnancy, so that you're going into that with your eyes open and you're making the decisions that are right for you and for your pregnancy and for your baby, not leaving it up to other people to make those decisions for you. And lastly, if you really need it, make sure you talk to your GP or your health visitor about getting extra help. And that might be help from a specialist team like I was talking about earlier. It might be medicines, it might be talking treatments. Um, and it's also really important not just to treat as I was saying, but again, to prevent things either getting worse or sometimes things coming on in the first place. So there's a lot that, that you can do to make sure the help is there for you. And I'm just gonna end up with a few slides. I know these slides are gonna stay on the website, I think. Um, so uh, you don't have to, quickly try and scribble down these huge URLs. Um, but here are just a few things. So in terms of keeping your, your, keeping your mental well-being as good as possible, the NHS websites in England and, and, and Wales and Northern Ireland and NHS Inform in Scotland are really good sources of information. 
But in addition, I'll just put up a few things here. Mind is a great charity, a uh, mental health charity that has information also specifically at the moment about coping with COVID. The Maternal Mental Health Alliance, another great umbrella organization of lots of charitable bodies and um, that has great resources on their website too. And if you're worried about um, pregnancy or having a small baby and uh, coronavirus infection, then the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists has a fantastic range of resources to tell you everything you need to know. And I've just put up a Scottish resource, but it's available outside Scotland too, um, Parent Club Scotland, which is really great at giving information around coping with parenthood um, and coping with the struggles and the trials and the tribulations of being a parent um, with small kids and with older kids. Um, and also they've got a great section on the difficulties right now with the lockdown and how much more of a challenge that is for people. So I really urge you to go on, on there and have a look at those resources. If you're not so well, or if you're worried about particular types of mental ill health, then the Royal College of Psychiatrists has great leaflets about mental ill health. And there's some specific, and I've only named a few of them here, but a few uh, charitable organizations that are specifically concerned with particular uh, problems like obsessive compulsive disorder, maternal OCD, or postpartum psychosis for action on postpartum psychosis. And I've shamelessly put up um, the website link to our service. There is no monetary reward in this for me whatsoever. Um, but it's just that we've got a, a link to lots more organizations on, on our webpage as well. So you're more than welcome to go and have a look at a few more links on that webpage too. And then for those of you who are concerned about taking medicines in pregnancy and or if you're breastfeeding then again the web the nhs websites are really good but there's another great website called bumps or uh, best use of medicines in pregnancy and you can type in a, uh, the medicine that you're on and get up-to-date reliable information on your medicines but i would say to you it's always really important not to take everything from websites but to talk to the professionals who are involved in your care and keep in mind being pregnant, having a small baby is a time where you're probably going to come in contact with more health professionals than at any other point in your life. So use them. Make sure they know if you're not uh, doing as well as you'd like to be doing. And that gives them the opportunity, hopefully, then to help you. So I'm going to stop there. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, and I think I'll go back to Louisa. And I suspect Louisa's got a few questions <laughs> lined up. Oh, sorry. What's oh. that? Oh. Can you see us, Louisa, again? Can you see the questions, Louisa? Yeah. Don't worry. I can. Rock, can you hear me? I can. Please. Yeah. So um, here's a few questions. Um, the first one is, I'm on day one of returning to work after a tough maternity leave, uh, postnatal depression, and then being in lockdown. Any tips for returning to work when confidence is at an all time low? Thank you. That's a, a really good question. Um, and I think you described a really common problem. And, and, and I think one thing to keep in mind is that when you go through uh, a depression or an anxiety state or other mental health problem, what sometimes people give less sort of time to recognizing is that you can recover really well from the illness itself, but then find- I think I'm back. Hello, oh. sorry. Hello, <laughs> Sorry, I, I don't know what happened then, but um, one of my podcasts started playing in my ear and I didn't know if everyone else could hear that as well. So I had to go on mute, but I think we're good now. I'm really sorry. No problem. We've just done the first question in the Q&A about returning to work, Louisa. So Perfect. Carry, carry on. So what I was going to say is that um, if you had a broken leg, and this is something I, I'd say to, to lots of people, if you had a broken leg, you, you would get uh, you get the leg set, you get a plaster or whatever these days on, and in about uh, a few weeks' time, that 
that bone would have knitted. But what you wouldn't do is go out and run a marathon the next day after you got the plaster cast off, because you'd need a period of rehabilitation, of building up the strength and the muscles again. And in a funny way, it's exactly the same for mental health problems. So if you go through a period of depression, you will get over that depression and fully recover, but you need that rehabilitation. And for mental health problems, that rehabilitation is about building your confidence back up again. Um, and one of the things that, that people, as they're feeling better, will notice is that when you're then faced with it, you may feel really great, but you're then faced with a, a challenge in your life, and that might be a big new life stage, like going back to work again, but that sets things back a small bit or, or, or knocks your confidence a little bit again. And so I guess what I, I would say to people is building up slowly is really important. If there's any way that you can do things like talk with your work about going back um, part-time, first of all, or building up your days or using some holidays to do it that way, that's a really good way of easing yourself back into a major change. And um, talking with your boss, talking with your employer about how you've been and how they can help make life a little easier in terms of modifying your job a small bit in the early stages is really important as well. And, and being, being kind to yourself, being saying to yourself, it's okay, I'm not going to maybe in my first uh, few days or a few weeks even back at the job do everything that I was doing before, but I will get there. Giving yourself a bit of slack as well is really important. Um, thank you very much. We've got another question from Catherine, which I found quite interesting. Um, she says, I wanted to ask Dr. Cantwell, can postnatal depression be diagnosed later? My youngest baby is 22 months and I feel I haven't felt right for at least a year with most symptoms of depression, low mood, major loss of confidence, feeling inadequate, not good enough in work, avoiding social gatherings. Um, and I've always had major separation anxiety with my two babies. Um, I've only not been with them while I'm at work and no other time. Is this more likely to be normal depression or is it postnatal depression? When does that, when does that change? That's a really good question as well. And, and it's a really, it's something I've been asked a, a lot of times. And I guess, although I've talked a little bit in, in the talk about some illnesses that seem really particular to the sort of the time, uh, either during or after having a baby like postpartum psychosis, a really unusual condition, a lot of the illnesses that we see or the problems that we see arising in pregnancy and postnatally are actually very similar to the problem, to those, to, to them happening at other times in a woman's life as well. Or so, so anxiety states, depression can happen at other times as well. And really what makes them distinctive and different isn't quite so much the fact that they're a, a whole different illness, but more to do with the fact that they're happening at a really important time in a woman's life when there are a whole host of extra changes. So I wouldn't say that there's postnatal depression and then there's a completely other condition called depression in many ways they're both depressions it's just that this depression is happening at a time that's so critical and so important for the woman for her pregnancy and for her developing relationship with her baby and so it's so important to get in there and get it treated as quickly as possible so if you're still having depression that's continuing on beyond the first postnatal year then in some ways, for me, it doesn't matter what you call it, as long as you get the right help and treatment, as long as you get the treatment for depression. And much of the treatment for depression happening earlier after having a baby is the same. But the extra bit is often to think about being in that circumstance where you're also looking after a small baby, where you're thinking about that developing relationship with your baby and the need for you to be better as quickly as possible for you and for your baby. So getting help quickly, getting help early is what's important. Thank you. We've got another question, which I thought was quite um, poignant for the current time. It's from Greta, who says, I have a nine month old um, without any help. These past three months have been really difficult. I can't even count the number of times I've called my mother and cried that I just can't cope. And I really need her help. I've been so tired and drained. I still don't know when I'll be able to see my family. And some days when the baby is cranky, it's just really hard. What advice would you give on how to cope with this? The usual advice under normal circumstances would be to get help and have a break, but at the moment, it's not something we can do. Thank you. I, can I just butt in here before you go? I just want to say, Greta, a baby never died from crying. And however old fashioned that sounds, trust me, they can scream and scream, but they will not, they will not kill themselves. And I found myself often putting the baby 
in a safe place in its car or, or in a pram and just walking away for five minutes. And more often than not, you will come back and that child will be fast asleep. Um, and you will have just had that five minutes. And I found when I was sometimes stuck in my house with no help and, and pulling my hair out that just stepping away and actually just breathing, just go do the washing up, put the baby somewhere where you can't hear it. And that's probably not the most popular thing to say. And there's lots of, you should never leave a baby to cry. But sometimes your mental health is, I think, more important than the long standing effects of whether or whether or not children suffer from being left to cry for five minutes. Um, and I actually think that, that for your own sanity, five minutes of your baby crying and being cranky is absolutely fine for you to just go and sit go go and walk around your garden just stand outside your front door and just have that peace um that would be my advice it might not be yours but i just think from a practical mum's advice at this point in time um your baby will be fine what what would you say i i would i you've you've, you've said much of what i would say too and, and i think sometimes there's that problem of people almost making a, a choice somehow thinking there's a difference between looking after your own mental health or some of that's being selfish um, and you're not looking after your baby. Actually, the most important thing in your baby's life is you. So looking after yourself, taking care of your own mental health is really, really good for your baby as well. And if that's five minutes time out, that's absolutely fine. And we've talked about some of the things in, in the talk earlier about things, tips for good mental health. But those are things you can't maybe see people face to face in the same way, but you can stay in touch with people. And it's really important to do that. And um, keeping, keeping active, making a plan for the day, having a bit of structure to the day is quite good as well. Trying to take a bit of time, if you can get it to do something that you actually enjoy, that is for you. So that going away when you're feeling really stressed, for five minutes and taking a few deep breaths and coming back again is good, but also maybe planning a bit of time to do something that you actually like and that you enjoy if you can manage to get that bit of time for yourself and if you've got somebody else around to help. And, and again, cutting yourself some slack. Don't be too hard on yourself. There isn't, a, a, I suspect, a new parent out there at all who hasn't said at some stage, I need to get away. I need some space to myself. Yeah. That is pretty normal. Um, so don't be too hard on yourself. And the, the last thing I would say at the moment is try not to get too caught up in, uh, for some people, it's because I'm a bit of a news junkie. So I spend my time watching the news and then I get my, find myself shouting at the TV and shouting at social media. So also go easy. Social media can be brilliant and the TV can be great, but limit it a little bit as well and do the things that actually help you relax. So that they um, be I think as well. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, we've got a question here that's come in from Graham, actually, um, who's asking, what are the telltale common symptoms mothers should be on the lookout for? And as a partner, how can I help my partner identify when she needs help? And I think that's really, you know, we talk about women so much, but actually men, men suffer as well. They kind of don't know what to do sometimes. And, and what, what would your advice to Graham be? I know you specialize in women, but just interested in your view. So, so, so that's really important. Um, and uh, our sort of most services around the UK and uh, that our specialist perinatal mental health services now very much recognise how important it is to look after the mental health of of fathers or partners as well. Um, and we'll often offer additional support for partners um, as well as for the woman herself. And that's for two reasons. It's, it's what Graham's just said. It's, it's great. It's really important. The partners who already know their, um, uh, their wife or girlfriend or partner um, best themselves, they, they know better than anyone else, but also um, they want to be able to help. They want to do uh, whatever they can to make sure they're picking up any problems. But the other thing that's really important is this really important is that they need to also look after their own mental health. It's a bit like we were saying about mothers and babies earlier on. Um, mm. If the partner isn't looking after his own mental health, then it's very hard for him to help his partner. So taking care of your own mental health is really good in this in, in these situations too. And um, in terms of what to look out for, then I would say and um, obviously there are lots of different mental health problems that pe people can have, but in terms of anxiety and depression, Everybody gets depressed. Everybody gets anxious um, for a period of time. But if that is keeping going, if that's not settling down after maybe 
10 days or two weeks, if people are feeling depressed most or all of the time, then that suggests that is, this isn't just adjusting to some particular difficulty. That's a little more. And that's a trigger certainly for talking to somebody. Um, and talking to somebody doesn't suddenly suck someone into lots of services or, 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 or cause them additional problems. It gets them hopefully the help at the level that they need. And that help might simply be being able to talk to their GP or their health visitor, or it might be seeing somebody to talk about specific treatment but it's getting help at the level the person needs. And if you're worried, trust your instincts. If you know this person, if you know your partner better than anyone else, trust your instincts. If they seem different, if they seem out of sorts compared to their usual self, then talk to somebody about it. You'll have the midwife calling you, you'll have the, the, the health visitor dropping in um, or getting in touch uh, in other ways at the moment. Uh, and there's no reason why you can't pass on your worries and your concerns to them. I'm just going to interrupt um, now, just to say we've got um, a couple of minutes, literally a couple of minutes left. So I'm sorry, we've got a lot of questions. So um, uh, Louisa, would you like to ask just one more and then we'll, I'm afraid, have to wrap it up. Can I just, can I just, yeah. I did one thing, sorry, a bit to the last about looking out for symptoms, because there was a really good question and um, that came in earlier from Sam talking about feeling angry a lot of the time and worried about how those feelings. And I, and I wanted to say though, although I said earlier that depression during pregnancy, postnatally, and at other times in a woman's life looks very much the same in many ways in terms of the symptoms. One of the things that's often striking is that sense of irritability um, and feeling angry at times that seems almost um, not unique to, but more common happening in, in women who get depressed in the postnatal period. So yeah, they're a sign, that's a sign sometimes of being depressed as well, and a sign that it's really important to get extra help and support. Thank you. Do, shall I do one more, Janet, or are we? Well, it's a quick one. <laughs> yeah. Um, some, oh, here we go. We had a question um, about take, quite a specific question. So it says, hello, I've taken, I'm not gonna say this right, Steratiline, steratiline for a few <laughs> years for anxiety. Um, I stopped when I found out I was pregnant, slowly reduced as suggested, but I'm really struggling again now. Um, it's likely lockdown related, having no help. The health visitor say, says go to the GP. The GP said, oh, just restart it. I'm exclusively breastfeeding. Is this an advisable drug for this? Can't get a straight answer from anyone because Corona seems to be the great excuse to ignore mental health issues as it's not a physical problem. Um, so quite a specific drug related question there. We had a few others come in that were quite specific about yeah. medication. This was the first thing I'd say you'd expect me to say is it's really hard to give out individual advice to somebody because I don't yeah. know them. I don't know uh, the person themselves and, and the particular treatments that they might need. But if I could just talk a bit in general about antidepressants, then again, it's an individual choice and different drugs are, are right for different people in different circumstances. But I would say as a general point, sertraline tends to be, and somebody who's not had an anti, if, if you've never had something before, so we have nothing to go on in terms of saying, oh, this one's the best one for you or what's worked. If you're starting a medicine from scratch and somebody is breastfeeding and they need an antidepressant, then sertraline is often our first choice because we, what we know about sertraline is that it gets through into breast milk in really, really low concentrations. And while I can never give 100% guarantees to anybody with medicines in pregnancy and breastfeeding, sertraline tends to be the one that we would uh, use if we're starting from scratch. So it's a reasonable choice um, to make. Perfect, thank you. Thank you. I would like to say a huge thank you, uh, Rock, for coming on today and uh, giving up your time, because I know you're very busy, uh, and answering all these questions. We've got lots more, um, so we'll work out a way of dealing with that um, uh, afterwards. Um, and also to Louisa, thank you for sharing your, um, your experiences. I know we've had some comments in the chat about how helpful that is. Um, I guess it's sad to say that um, still um, mental health and particularly maternal mental health, um, there is some taboo and, and uh, it does carry stigma. But I hope that um, everybody listening today um, can take from this that um, talking and sharing 
uh, and reaching out for help um, is a really good start. Um, and, uh, you know, we just are enormously grateful to you both for uh, coming on today. Um, and again, can I just say, if you, uh, if you have the opportunity, please go on to our website, Wellbeing of Women. Uh, and if you can, please donate, become a regular donor. It really doesn't matter how big or small your donation, but it will go to, towards women's health research um, and um, probably into the mental health um, awareness um, for um, you know, mums and uh, about to be mums. So thank you very much. Um, uh, have a great day, um, everybody. Um, and do uh, sign in to our next one, uh, our next uh, health webinar, which will be in early July. We're just um, finalising the details. But thank you very much for joining us today. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.